This channel is brought to you by the family of Bill Britton. Written material may be ordered at BillBrittonMinistries.com. All of Bill Britton's messages are sent out for an offering of any size. This is a faith ministry made possible by the members of the body of Christ. We give God all the glory and pray He blesses this message wherever it goes. Turn to the book of Revelation chapter 1. We have been for some time in uh, chapter 1 and the first, the verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. These four verses, and I don't want to just breeze through them because as we examine these four verses, in these verses there are 15 things said about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I know there are some here who have not been with us in a lesson here that we're teaching on the book of Revelation. And let me just uh, say to you that we approach this book not just desiring to know who the Antichrist is or when the tribulation will begin or uh, what's going to happen to us, but we approach this book to find out who Jesus Christ is. Because this book starts out, in the first five verses of this book says the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And on those five words, we're basing an approach into the book of Revelation. And when we get to verse 5, then we find this phrase beginning in verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is. And when we look at those words, Jesus Christ, who is, then we begin to see in the next four verses who he is and things about him. And uh, we don't want to belabor the point too much, but this morning I have uh, dealt with some things in verse uh, 5 and 6, particularly in verse 5, but I have 35 scriptures to deal with. No way that I can do that this morning. I've decided to cut it short because the main thought that I got as I begin to read this we have uh, already mentioned who he is, the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us. Unto him that loved us. And this thought has been pounding on my heart, my mind, for at least two weeks since I began to approach the next step I take in the book of Revelation. He loved us. Now, a lot of people have a misconception of God, that he's our papa in the sky, the big man with a beard and all this. And that is a misconception because people try to put God on the level of, uh, of a human being, a little bigger, a little smarter, uh, more powerful, but in the same realm as a human being. And that is not true. Now, if I were to try to find a comparison, it would be impossible for me to compare uh, what God is to us as to what we are to something else. But let me just compare us to an insect, an ant, or a grasshopper. How many of you have ever stepped on an anthill or... Maybe when you're younger and a little less compassionate, see an ant crawling in your house or across the sidewalk and just step him and grind him under your foot. You have no compassion for that ant. It's an insect. It's not even on our level. How many of you have ever really fallen in love with an ant? And really loved that ant to where you'd lay your life down for him? Well, there they go. They're all over the world. The population of the ant is unknown. Ant hills, building cities under the ground, digging around in the earth. While we are here, human beings, eternal creatures that are going to live forever, dreaming dreams, the human race, building nations and hospitals, creating songs, Great paintings, writing books. Totally different world than what the ant lives in. But that is no way 
to compare with the difference between our almighty God and we who are worms upon this earth. And that's what the Bible says. The psalmist realized when he compared himself, he said, Lord, I'm just a worm. Oh, God says, let me show you about that worm, though. That earthbound, crawling, ugly creature that is a worm, I'll show you how I can transform him into a heaven-bound, beautiful, desirable butterfly. Hallelujah. That I found out the other night has some value sometimes. Hallelujah. But God loved us. And I try to think of that as a loving a grasshopper. I might see a poor grasshopper with a broken leg and feel sorry for it. But love it. But he loved us. He loved us. And what a mystery this is. We blithely, glibly mouth the word love. God loves me. I love God. I love everybody. But it's a mystery how God loved us. Why God loved us. And friend... If you're here today without God, if you're here today, don't know the Lord, I want you to go away from here knowing God loves you. Amen. Why? That's the mystery. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. Herein is love. Here's love. This is what love is. Not that we love God but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God didn't just say, I love you, little grasshopper human, and let it go at that. Let us believe it, have faith for it. He demonstrated his love with the greatest gift, the unspeakable gift of God to show that he loves us. I don't know. I'm sure that everyone here has somebody who loves you. And you may have somebody who loves you so much you couldn't destroy the love no matter what you did to them. But most of us, if somebody loves us, could destroy, and many have destroyed the love that people have for us. By the hurts, humiliation, and things we inflicted upon them. We can destroy a love that a person has for it. No one can destroy the love that God has for us. No matter what you do, you can hurt him. You can tear his heart. But you can't make him stop loving you. You may inflict pain upon his heart when he sees you sliding off under your own will into the pits of hell. And we never want to forget that we believe in hell, fire, and brimstone. And people who have somehow got away from this and thought, oh, well, the big daddy in the sky, he's full of love, and he'll never let anything happen to me. A lot of people are going to split hell wide open. That's not to say that we're going to become a fire and brimstone church, as per se. But we believe in that. And it hurts him to see someone of their own will defy God, turn aside His grace, reject His love and reject His sacrifice, and dive headlong into hell. But He won't quit loving you. Hallelujah. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse number 19. We love him. We do. We love him. Because. There had to be a reason for us to love him. I don't know the reason God loved us. It didn't say God loved us because. It said God loved us and did something for us. But with us, we love him because. 
We didn't come into life starting out loving God. We were enemies of God. But there's a because, a reason why we love God. We love God because he first loved us. Amen. Hallelujah. He loved us as sinners. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. Romans 5 and verse 8. But God commended his love toward us. In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is how God commended his love. This is how God showed his love. This is how God extended his love to us, that while we were sinners, hadn't done a thing for God, had done nothing but work against God, he sent his son to die for us. That's how God proved his love. As sinners. When we had nothing lovely in us, he loved us. Yeah. Hallelujah. I want to talk about a few fellows that God loved. God loved Abraham. You know, he tells us that these Old Testament saints and Israel and things happened to them were happening as an example for us. So let's use Abraham as an example of God's love. Hallelujah. Now, Abraham was a pretty good fella. But there came a time when he missed God. And he got out of the will of God. He went down into Egypt. He lied about his wife. Got her into a situation where she could have been defiled. And the whole plan of God to bring a son through her could have been thwarted. He brought that about by taking her down there into Egypt. But God loved that man. And he appeared to the king who had Abraham's wife in his harem getting ready to marry her. He appeared to that king in a dream. He said, King, you touch that woman, you're a dead man. That man's a prophet. He's my man. He may have made a mistake. He may have got out of the will of God. He may have lied, done some ungodly thing, but he's my man. He's my prophet. I'll change him. But don't you touch his wife. Don't you mess up his life. Let me tell you, children, I don't know how many of you have gotten out of the will of God and then decided, I guess God doesn't love me anymore. How could he love me, what I've done? Look at me, what a mess I've made out of my life. I've lied and a lot of other things. And God couldn't love me anymore. I'll just give up. Not so. He's watching over you. He loves you. You're his. What do you do when you get to the place where you don't know what the will of God is? Abraham was in a place where famine had begun to work in, in uh, Canaan land. He didn't know what to do. That's why he went to Egypt. What do you do when you get to the place where nothing seems to work? Everything's not coming together. Nothing's coming together. And you're out of the will of God. And you don't know where the will of God is. And you pray and your prayer hits the ceiling and bounces back in your face. And God doesn't answer your prayer. And you're walking in darkness. What do you do? Well, it's in the book. Always comforting when you can find the answer in the book. Amen. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 10. Who is among you? I'm asking you this morning. Who is among you that fears the Lord? And obeys the voice of his servant, doing the best you can, that walks in darkness and has no light. I try to obey the word. I fear the Lord. But I'm walking in darkness. I have no light. I don't know where the will of God is. God's left me. God doesn't love me anymore. He said, what do you do? Who is there among you that is in this condition? He said, let him trust in the name of the Lord. And stay upon his God. 
Are you walking in dark? You don't know what the will of God is. Things aren't coming together for you. Feel like you're down in Egypt. Everything's falling apart. You're walking in darkness. You don't have any light. God won't speak to you. What do you do? He said, stand steady and stand upon your God. He's a rock. And know that he loves you. Don't ask me why. Some people I find it hard for me to love them. I don't know how God can love them. He knows so much more about them than I do. But he loves you. Yeah. Hallelujah. God loved Jacob. Can't take them all, but I like to talk about Jacob. It was revealed there in Genesis, Jacob was a deceiver. He was a trickster. He was a swindler. When you saw Jacob come in, you put your hand on your pocket. Because when he left, he'd have half your fortune if he could get it. That's the way he was. Laban found out about it. Esau found out about it. He was named Jacob. Because the Lord knew what he was going to be. And he put it in the hearts to name him Jacob. Deceiver. Conniver. Swindler. And God loved him. See, in uh, Malachi chapter 1 and verse 1, Malachi, the last prophet, the Old Testament said, The burden of the Lord, of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I love Jacob. And I hated Esau. But he said, I love Jacob. He knew what he was going to be, knew what he was. But he said, I loved him. Hallelujah. He loved him before he was born. Oh, what a great God we've got. He loved him when he was running. He ran from Esau after he stole his birthright. That God was going to give it to him anyhow. But he stole it and he ran. Went over to Uncle Laban's. And God loved him and began to bless him. And he blessed him and he blessed him. Made him rich. He went over there empty-handed. He came back with four wives, 12 sons, and a whole pasture full of sheep and oxen and goats and camels and everything else. Why? Because God loved him. And God blessed him. And God prospered him. In his running. In his scheming. While he was making schemes to outwit his uncle Laban. Who was trying to outwit him. God was blessing him. But at the same time, God was preparing to change his life. God was not happy with him being a schemer. Conniver. Deceiver. Oh, he loved him. But he wasn't happy with what he was. But he was planning to change him. So on the way home, God met him one night and wrestled with him all night long. And finally, at the break of dawn, the day was about to come, and Jacob felt like he had to get a blessing before he turned his one loose. He knew he had somebody there. And he said, bless me before you go. And God said to him, in essence, I'm not going to bless you where you are. I'm not going to bless what you are. But he made him confess. Who are you? I am. What is your name? What's your nature? What are you? I'm Jacob, a conniver, a schemer. Realizing what he was. And God said, all right, I'm going to change you. You're not going to be Jacob anymore. You're going to be Israel, a prince with God. Now, God loves you where you are. That does not mean that he wants you to stay there so he can just keep on loving you. He wants to change your life. Right. Hallelujah. We've heard a lot about change this morning. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4. Romans 2 and verse 4. Hallelujah. Despisest thou the riches of his goodness, God's goodness, and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing 
that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Do you despise what the good things that God does for you? Going on in your sin, going on in your rebellion. Oh, God's good. God gives me good things. And despise it not knowing that that's supposed to lead you to repentance. Right. Hallelujah. Leads you to a life-changing situation. God blessed Jacob in such marvelous ways, but he was leading him to the place where he could change his life and make him the foundation of the family of God back there in the Old Testament. I want God to bless you. I want him to be good to you. I want him to prosper you, and I believe he is. I've seen a lot of blessings of God fall upon people in this congregation. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. But I want you to understand that when God does bless you, he's not putting his seal of approval upon your running and your scheming and your rebellion. He's leading you to a place of change, a place of repentance, of turning around. Let the blessing of God touch your heart and know that God loves you enough to want to change you. Hallelujah. God loved Paul the Apostle. Saul of Tarsus, he loved him. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians 1, verse 15 and 16. It pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and call me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathens. It pleased God to call Paul or Saul of Tarsus from his birth. The very moment he's born. Now you follow that man's history. He went into the Jewish community. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He took the whole route. You know, he went along with their system. Then he went out full of fury against those who were moving in God, trying to destroy the, this new tongue-talking group of believers. Did everything he could. But all the time, God loved him. God had chosen him. God had separated him. And I have questioned in my heart sometimes about this. How come God took a man so undeserving to give him such a position in the kingdom of God. In my eyes, in my opinion, I believe that Paul the Apostle was probably, aside from Jesus, the greatest man in the New Testament. Writer of 14 books in the New Testament. Man had poured his life out, changed the world, turned the world upside down, as our brothers read to us this morning. Here's the man that did that. But why didn't God choose somebody that was sweet and humble and spirit-filled and, and uh, uh, gracious and kind and all that in his life to, to do this through? Like Ananias, who went over and laid his hands on him. You know, the man that, not the Ananias and Sapphira man, but the Ananias that went over and God spoke to him and said, Saul of Tarsus is in town. Yeah, Lord, I heard about him. I want you to go over and tell him that I'm going to use him. Why didn't God use Ananias? He was a good brother. Why didn't you use some of the other prophets or some of the men of God back there to do this great work that he was going to do? Good old Barnabas, sweet brother, compassionate, loving and kind. Why didn't God just say, Barnabas, you qualify for this. You're a good deserving brother. But no, God chose one who was tearing around, mad, angry, at the church of Jesus Christ and said, I'm going to use him. I love that man. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. Oh, the grace of God. Yeah. What a demonstration of the power of God's grace. His, his un, uh, blessings that come to the undeserving. Blessings without favor, without merit. God said, I'm going to take him. And so Paul was separated by the grace of God. You know, God loves when others cannot. You take Paul, Saul of Tarsus, and here's a precious, spirit-filled believers that are following the Lord Jesus. They love God, given everything they have to the apostles for the kingdom of God. Sold their land, everything, given the apostles. 
And here comes Saul of Tarsus with some soldiers tearing into their home. Haul the, the husband off to jail. Warn the others in the family. Never to say anything about this Jesus again. Put him on trial. Stone him to death. Now go tell that wife. Go tell those children. Remember that man who come and got your daddy? Took him up and put him on trial, stoned him. He's God's special servant. God's chosen him. God loves him. Think they believe you? Oh. But brother, God's love goes beyond what we see in the present. Yes. We see things that are hurtful. We see things in the present that are, uh, that we don't like. But God goes beyond the present. And his love extends beyond it because he knows what he's going to do. He knows what he's going to change. One of the great accusations, I say great, I mean greatly used accusations, against God is that if God is a God of love, why all the pain and war and, and uh, uh, hurt and all, everything in the, world, in the world today? Why is the little children come in the war, world blind and crippled? Why is it let people starve to death over in um, Pakistan? If God is the God of love, why is he let all this? Look, God is looking beyond what's going on right now. He's looking down there and he sees something. He's going to change and he's going to bring glory out of it. It's going to turn this world and his creation upside down. God loved Mary Magdalene. Yes, he did. She was unclean. She was immoral. She was full of lust. But God loved her. He found something in her he could love. Luke chapter 7 and verse um, 36 here. Luke 7, beginning in verse 36. Here's another woman that Jesus loved. We don't know her name, but she was of the same mold that Mary Magdalene was before Jesus found her. One of the Pharisees desired he would come and eat with him. He went into the Pharisee's house and sent down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. And that word sinner there is a word in the original which means an unchaste or an immoral, unclean woman, a sinner. Not just somebody that stole her neighbor's lawnmower or donkey. That is her lawnmower, Zachary, like you know. Hallelujah. They kept them to chew the grass down. No, this woman was a sinner, unclean, immoral. And she came in where they were eating. And she brought an alabaster box of ointment. Now, that, that type of woman, they ordinarily did not have a lot of money. What they had to do for their money was a degrading thing. And it didn't come easy. And here she had something very precious. An alabaster box of anointment. And she came in. in. This could have been sold. It could have uh, supported her maybe for quite a while. The money to feed her. But she brought it in. Stood at his feet behind him weeping. Began to wash his feet with tears. Wipe them with the hairs of her head. And kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. God touched this woman's heart. She was unworthy, aren't we all? But she was unworthy and she knew it. But she had a great desire to do something to bless this man. She began to wash his feet and anoint him with the ointment. Well, the old Simon, who hadn't even given Jesus the courtesy that they do at feast back there to have a servant wash his feet when they come in, hadn't extended that to him. He began to think in his heart, hmm, I was right. This man is not a prophet. Because if he was a prophet, he'd know that this woman's an unclean sinner. <laughs> Hallelujah. I have to tell you this. Brother Crow probably remember this quite well. Back in 1949, Brother Crow was in my church in Panama City, or Port St. Joe. Highland View, Florida, which is a little fishing village outside of Port St. Joe. 
which is a little town a little ways from Panama City. But he was there, and we were having a service, and a woman got up and spoke in tongues, gave a message in tongues. Brother Carl interpreted it. The word of judgment. And uh, afterwards, some people came to me and said, Brother, we are confused. This woman is a backslider. She's a corrupt, evil, uh, impure, immoral woman. She's a town harlot, that's what she is. And that preacher just interpreted her tongue. She used to be spirit-filled. She used to know God. Had to give the tongues. Now, how can this be? And he interpreted. We can understand that a person spoken in tongues can do it again if they get away from God. The gifts of God are without repentance, but we don't, it couldn't be genuine. How, how is this? I said, Brother Crow, he said, well, you remember the message was a message of judgment. And what God was doing was speaking through her own mouth. A word to her own self to let her hear the judgment that was upon her. She didn't turn to God. God loved her so much, he let her, he spoke right through her to herself. Hallelujah. But here, just like those people were confused because they knew this woman, so did Simon know this woman is washing Jesus' feet. If this man was a prophet, he would know who that woman was. He'd know she was unclean. Did he? Oh, he knew her. He knew her what she was, but he knew something else. He knew what was in her heart. He knew her heart was breaking. He knew her heart was open. So he said, Simon, I got something to say to you. In fact, the Bible says he answered Simon. Now, Simon hadn't said a thing, but he answered him. He'd only thought in his heart, see. And... Um, Jesus answering, said, Simon, I have someone to say. And he said, go ahead. And he said, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence, the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave both of them. Now, which one loves him the most? Well, Simon said, I guess the one that owed him the most ought to love him the most. He got forgave the most. Ah, he said, you're thinking right. Thinking right. But he said, to whom most is forgiven. He said, I entered into your house. You didn't give me any courtesy. You gave me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with her. You gave me no kiss, but she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto her, the, her sins, which were many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. You don't love me. You have no courtesy for me. You have no affection for me because you haven't been forgiven anything. Why? Because he didn't bring anything to Jesus to forgive. He thought he was already okay. I have nothing. But I, you know, that's for somebody else. Oh, boy. How we like to pass it over, you know. Go to a prison. I've preached in prisons, in jails, and uh, you go to a prison, begin to talk to them about their soul, about their need for God. Me, I haven't done anything. Why should I go to hell? I haven't done anything bad. Oh, this little charge they had on me, yeah, well, that amounts to nothing, just the way things are. But they're righteous in their own eyes. Preacher, one time had a small church, and he went, had one dear sister, and uh, she had a real need. He was trying to get through to her about that. I think I told you one time about preaching in a country church out here, just out of Springfield, and and uh, I had one brother that had a special need, and I was preaching. I was I was reading a scripture in Isaiah. I forget what scripture it was. I was reading, and I saw just a verse or two ahead. It was going to hit his need. Oh, boy, he needs to hear this. And I looked up, and he sat in his seat asleep, as he usually did. What am I going to do? I don't want to holler at him and embarrass him. I don't want to break my anointing. I was preaching under a, a, a strong anointing. And so I had a, had a, a 
pulpit with a thing like this, and I had a little pie plates they used for offering baskets. And so I just kept on preaching and talking. I just sailed it down the aisle like that and landed right alongside of him. That pie plate hit the floor. Bang, you know, woke him up. He looked at that thing skidding on down. He looked up at me, and he straightened up, and he began to listen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and I got my point across. Years later, I went back to church, and he come up to me and introduced himself, said, Brother Britton, you know, uh, who, uh, you remember who I am? I'm the fellow you threw the offering plate at. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, he's with the Lord now, praise God. Died, went to heaven. But he has ways to get our attention, doesn't he? Hallelujah. And so this preacher would preach, and he'd hit this, this woman's needs. Every time he'd preach a real sermon right down the line, She'd come up to him and say, oh, preacher, that was a great sermon. Said, you really give it to him tonight. He said, well, in his heart, he said, I wasn't them I was giving it to. It was you I was giving it to. But, you know, he couldn't bring him to tell her that. So one night it snowed. Nobody could get to church but her. She lived real close to the church. And when he got to church, she's the only one there. Oh, boy, he said, she won't be able to say I'll give it to them tonight. So he preached and he really come down on, on uh, her needs and really hit it hard. And after it's all over, she came up to him and said, Brother Preacher, you did wonderful tonight. And if they'd have been here, you'd have sure give it to them tonight. <laughs> oh, how we like to put it off, see. We, not us, it's for somebody else. And Simon, he didn't see his need. He didn't see anything to bring to Jesus to ask forgiveness for. But this woman had something in her heart she wanted, for, she knew she needed help. And that's a first step to deliverance. And Jesus loved her. I can't understand. You know, the, I'm sure the Jews didn't understand. If this man's going to love somebody, let him love this, this pillar in the community. Brother Simon, who's blessed many people, who goes to the temple regularly, gives good gifts to the temple, supports the priest, all of this. Why don't he love him instead of this harlot? But Jesus looked inside, and she was drawing his love, and he loved her. He loved David. He loved David as, as a child. When nobody knew what was in David, he knew what was in David. Lined his brothers up, the prophet did. God said, I'm going to call a king out of the sons of Jesse. Line up the sons of Jesse. Look at them. First one looked good to Samuel. Said, this must be the one. No, God said, you're looking at the outward appearance. I'm looking at his heart. There's something in there I don't see. I'm looking for something. Well, he looked at all seven of them. Couldn't find the one he's after. He said, is this all you got? No, we got one that would send for him. He's out there taking care of the sheep. You wouldn't want to say, send for him. I'm going to stand here. I'm not going to rest. I'm going to sit down until he gets here. And I'm kind of tired. And don't keep me standing long. So, wing, they went away to get him. Here he come running in. The little lad. And Samuel looked at him, and God said, in essence, I love him. I've chosen him. I've called him to be my king. The sweet psalmist of Israel, the beloved of the Lord. God had a special affection for this man. And in his sin, you know, it must hurt God for those that he loves so much to pull such stupid things. And here David is, everything in life he wants, and looks over in somebody else's courtyard and sees his wife. Ends up in adultery and murder. You couldn't get much worse than that. Adultery and murder. Because back there they didn't have marijuana as far as I know. Well, you couldn't get much worse as a sinner. And here he was. In his sin. Nobody knew. Well, there was something new, but nobody was saying anything about it. But God said, I love that man. I love him. Now, I'm going to deal with his sin. He's going to, going to cost him for what he did. But I love him. And he sent the prophet to him. And the prophet come and said, David, uh, king, we got a problem out here. 
We have a man who has a whole pasture full of sheep, all that he wants, everything he needs. And we had another fellow that lives across the street from him and just had one little sheep that he raised from a pet, just like a, a son to him, you know, just a, a child almost to him. And, and he said, somebody came to visit this preacher. He wanted some lamb steak that night, lamb chops. So instead of getting one of his sheep out there in the pasture, he went over there and got this fellow's pet and kicked, killed him and roasted him and had his meal. Oh, David said, that's wicked. That's wicked. A man to do that deserves to die. Die? Yeah, doesn't deserve to live. Tell me who he is. I'll deal with him. The prophet said, thou art the man. You're the man. God has given you everything, and you've gone and taken another man. Only treasure. Beautiful woman. The only thing in life that really meant a whole lot to him. And you've taken it from him. And kill him. Oh. Hear me now. This is the mystery of this Christ. We're in the book of Revelation. We're looking to see the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is he? What is he like? He never stops loving. That does not mean he will not deal with the sin. Oh, he'll have a prophet somewhere. He'll deal with that thing. He'll lay it heavy on you. And if you're a son, he'll use a scourge. If you're just a tiny little child, he may get a paddle. Otherwise, the social services may come out with a saying he's abused the child. Hallelujah. I haven't advised all the parents to burn their switches yet, but sometimes you wonder uh, if you're going to have to. Where well, the government say you can't chastise the children anymore. Well, God chastises his children according to their maturity. And David was a king. And brother, when you read the history of what happened after that, it's sad. David carried sorrow with him. Out of that came the 51st Psalm. One of the most beautiful passages of Scripture of a heart crying for forgiveness. Oh, God, cleanse me. Forgive me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation. I've sinned. But God never stopped loving him. God was with him, kept him the rest of his days. Let me just say something here. God loved Job. Somebody said, if God loved Job so much, why did he let him suffer like he did? Ever heard that today? If God is a God of love, why is my child like this? Why is my wife going through such suffering? Why is my husband man of a job for six months? If God's a God of love, why, why, why? Oh, Job's wife came to him and said, look, you've messed up, fella. I don't know what it is God's got against you, but you're a dead man. Why don't you just curse God and die? You're no good for anything. God doesn't love you anymore. Oh, Job wouldn't accept that. He said, you talk like a foolish woman. He said, I came naked in this world. Naked I'll go out of it. Anything I hear is the grace of God. And he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. Yes. He loves me. Right. And in the midst of all the pain, and brother, he was suffering pain, boils from his head to his feet. Sitting out there on an ash heap because no other place uh, was fit for what he, he was so nasty. Humiliated in front of his neighbors that he'd been like a king to. Had helped them and supported them and given them uh, their needs and all. Here he is after the kids making fun of him, throwing rocks at him. His friends coming down telling him what a big sinner you must be. Or God wouldn't do this to you. Theologically they had him figured out. So his theology he couldn't understand. The humiliation of it, the pain of it. But all this time, God loved him. And God was doing something for him that down in the future, he would be compensated for many times. In the second chapter, I don't know what the second Corinthians, I mean, the fourth chapter. I don't know if you've been going through this. This is one of the devil's favorite weapons, you know. To accuse God. He doesn't love you. Look what he's doing to you. Look what he's allowing in your life. 
Look what's happening to you. God doesn't love you. But I want to tell you this morning, he loves you. I don't know if you've had a Job experience where you've been tempted with this thought. You've been suffering things you didn't understand, didn't deserve. Job didn't deserve what was happening to him. Not in what we call deserve. He hadn't done all that wickedness. He'd done his best. But God was writing some eternal pages in his book. God was going to bless millions through the story of this one man. And what is life all about anyhow, except to leave your mark in the world? Men strive. Oh, if I can just be president, they put my name down in history books. Well, some people you remember, who was the president that followed Garfield? Who was the president that followed Garfield? Anybody know? See, not many people can come up with that answer. Now we know a few, Lincoln, Washington, Franklin Roosevelt, you know, that's done some things, made their mark. But men strive to make their mark. Well, here's a man that God loves so much that he gave him great rewards. And he left a mark on this world that few men have ever done. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. For our light affliction, now it don't seem light, but he says it's light. You know what affliction is? Oh boy. I, uh, we had in our church one time a uh, sister in South Carolina, Pearly Jackson. Sister Pearl Jackson. Anybody here remember when we had her? Yeah. All right. But she had testified. She testified here. She came. But she had gotten turned on to the message of sonship and had scattered my books down through South Carolina. In fact, she gave them to a pastor and began to be like a paper missionary and opened the church up there. And he invited me down for a meeting. And I went down there and preached a revival a couple of weeks. And that whole thing was turned upside down. That, that church was just revolutionized through her efforts, see, to get the message in. And, uh, but she had, prior to this, she had been working in a textile mill and had uh, gotten sick. Now, I can't tell you all the things she's sick with. She had a cancer in her stomach that eaten a hole clear through her stomach to the outside where they had to dress the outside, place as big as a silver dollar or half a dollar, I think it was, something like that, and uh, every day. And uh, it was killing her. It was terminal. They couldn't do anything about it. She had hydropsy, she had uh, arthritis, she had pellagra, she had, uh, I don't know, several other things. But she had, her heart condition would not allow her to sleep and lay down in a bed. She had to sleep in a wheelchair, sitting up in a wheelchair or in a chair for eight years. She couldn't lay down. Suffered constantly. Her husband, drunken husband, come in and beat her and take her money. If she was drawing compensation from her job to go out and get drunk some more. That's suffering. Well, the good news was that one day she heard about a little Baptist lady that had prayed for her granddaughter and was healed. She said, you got to take me out there. So they took her out there and this little Baptist lady, Spirit Phil, out in the country in South Carolina, prayed for her and she was immediately healed. The cancer was gone. The place was as smooth as a on her stomach. Uh, everything was immediately gone except the dope addictions because she had been on narcotics. She had been on uh, painkillers so long. For seven years she had had these uh, uh, dope been fed in her body until she was addicted. And uh, so when she went back and um, somebody called and said, I hear you're healed. She said, I'm going to take a nap. I'm going to lay down. And if I can lay down and sleep, I know I'm healed. I'll let you know. And she did. And when she woke up, this dope, this addiction hit her. And she went through withdrawal pains. And they, they came in, and she was going through terrible things. People were trained. People were coming in to watch her. She's suffering. And she said, they called the doctor, said, Dr. Waddle, you said, get her to the hospital here. Said, we've got to take her off gradually. She can't go off cold turkey. It'll kill her. She's in it too deep. And her age and all, it'll kill her if she tries to stop together. She had washed all of her pills down, flushed them down the toilet. 
She said, I'll never take another one. If I die, I'll never take another. I promised God if he'd heal me, I'd never take another pill, never take another drop, uh, another dope, another dope. And so she, the doctor said, tell her that she's got to. I've got to have to take her off gradually. And, you know, and, and uh, she said, tell him I will never take another one. He said, well, on the phone, somebody's talking on the phone. He said, well, then tell her that God bless her. It's all I can do for her. He hung up. And at that moment, God delivered in those demons of addiction. Hallelujah. And she said, if they'd had, people had spiritual eyes, they could have seen a whole army of devils marching out the door of that dope addiction. And she was totally healed. But the pain and the suffering, she went, nobody knew. People around uh, South uh, Greens, Greens, Greenville, Greenville, South Carolina, where the textile mill where she's working, they didn't know why she'd gone through this. And her, the way your husband treated her. And she had an insurance policy. Now hear this. She had an insurance policy with uh, Palmetto Insurance Company. Now I'm ins I was an insurance man. I know how they think. And this is a very unusual situation. But she had this life insurance policy that had a uh, disability clause on it so that she was still disabled, the policy continued without any more payments until she was able to work again. So the doctor would come out periodically every six months. The company doctor was required to come out and examine her and see if she was still disabled and all. Well, after several years of this, about uh, five years went by like this, and he finally decided, well, um, you know, there's no sense to me coming out here. This woman is die, uh, dying. She'll never get well. And she owes this big hospital or medical bill to the doctors and all. And so uh, the best thing to do is pay her off now so she can pay her medical bill rather than have her drunken husband get the money after she's dead because as a beneficiary. So they said to her, uh, so you can pay your bills if you will sign this release. I will pay you off and you can pay your medical bills. All right? So they called some neighbors in to witness all this. It's good for the insurance company to do this, you know, get all the neighbors in. <laughs> and they paid Pearlie off. A life insurance policy. She wasn't dead yet, but they paid her life insurance off. <laughs> and she paid her medical bills. Two years later, God healed her. And after he healed her, somebody said, you reckon the insurance company's going to want their money back? She said, I don't know. So she went down to the insurance company and she walked in. And she said, uh, they said, yes, ma'am, what can I do for you? I said, I'm Pearlie Jackson. I said, uh, you all paid me my life insurance policy off here about five, uh, two years ago. And said, I want to know if you want your money back. He said, what are you talking about? He had been a new man I hired on. And somebody in the back said, Miss Jackson, is that you? Yeah, I know you. He came up and said, uh, and talked to her and said, she told him, said, God has healed me. I'm not sick anymore. And I want to know if you want your money back. No. <laughs> they called the manager and said, we don't want our money back. God bless you. Just go on. There's some marvelous things that happen to you. But the pain she went through, the suffering. You talk about Job. Brother, I can compare Job's experience with her. But out of this, souls were saved all over South Carolina. When she got healed, the, her sickness, uh, people were in churches all over South Carolina were praying for Pearlie Jackson. To be healed. Pastors knew about it. And the word scattered about this poor woman up there in Greenville. She was a member, I think, of the Church of God. Forget now. And they were all praying for her. And um, so when she was healed, well, they wanted her to come and give her testimony. And she went, she was on the go day and night, constantly going around, testifying. People were getting saved. People's faith were being built up. People were being healed. I've got her testimony. The compensation that's come to her because of her suffering. Our light affliction, he says, which is but for a moment. Eight years is a moment? Oh, yes. Eight years is just a moment in God's economy, in eternal light of eternity, which is but for a moment. Works for us. Oh, that affliction is working for us. A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That glory that's going to come is eternal. It's not going to be for eight years. Not going to be for ten times what you suffered. It's an eternal glory. And Job went through this. Her husband. Her husband had told her she had begged him to give his heart to God. He said, Pearlie, said, if God is real, and if he ever healed you, then I'd serve him. 
If he ever healed you, I'd serve him. Well, God healed her. Shook him up. So for a while he tried to do better and he served him. But uh, went back to his old ways. And a cancer came upon him. And I went to Greenville, South Carolina. Went into their home. And old Mr. Jackson was dying with cancer. I went out there t uh, to his place. Well, he was a, I think, a, a rifle uh, enthusiast, you know, liked to shoot target practice. Off. So we went out and, and uh, we set up some targets. We had a little fun shooting rifles, you know, together uh, there and had some fellowship with him. Then he took me up in the mountains to show me some things and I got kind of close to him. But when we came back down, uh, later we came back when he, had, he was dying with his cancer. And I wouldn't be surprised it wasn't the same one that left her. All right? But I said to him, Mr. Jackson, you're, right, you're ready to meet God. No, he wasn't. You want to get right with God. Yes, he did. And I prayed with him. And he gave his heart to God. And was a believer. And served God then until not long after he passed away. But through her sufferings and all. And all this took place. A soul. Her own husband won to God. Besides the many other souls who won to God. All right. Our right affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Hallelujah. Brother, God loves you. Amen. Somebody was suffering one time. I don't remember the circumstances. But they were complaining to me about all they were going through. I looked at them. I said, you know, I haven't gone through stuff like that. God must love you more than he does me. He must want to give you more glory than he's going to give me. It looked at me kind of funny. And I gave him the scripture. Your suffering is working for you an eternal weight of glory. Don't complain about it. Give praise to God. Give glory to God. Oh, I'm not saying ask for more suffering. I'd like, I'd, I'm, I'm uh, uh, satisfied to get my glory some other way. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. But I'm saying that God will take that, which is suffering, and bring glory out of it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, now we can say, I want to look, look at one, to, one more, and that's Daniel. God loved Daniel. He was called a beloved of the Lord. And uh, uh, I read it in Daniel. I don't remember the verse now. But greatly beloved of the Lord, the angel said to him when he came to visit him. Praise the Lord. I do believe, believe I can find that. Let me just read that here. Glory to God. And verse, uh, chapter 10 and verse 19. And he said, there came to me again, verse 18, one like the appearance of a man. He strengthened me. And he said, oh, man greatly beloved, fear not. Daniel was a man greatly beloved. God loved this boy. He had been a, he'd been a boy, not like uh, Abraham had gone out and lied. No, he had stood for God. If it cost him his life, he's going to stand for God. From the day he went into Babylon, he wouldn't take the king's food. From the day they built a lion's den, he wouldn't compromise with the sinners. God loved him. But if God loved him so much, why did he put him in captivity? Why did he bring about these circumstances he was in? He was in a captive place in a heathen land. But God loved him. And God used him there. I have so many people that complain about their circumstances. Or if I were just someplace else. Or if I just had a better house. Or if I just had a better job. Or if I just had better people around me. But God loves you where you are. Amen. That does not mean that he's going to take you out of Babylon and take you back over there and, and put you back in the temple of God. No, he's going to use you where you are. Amen. That man made an impact not only upon Babylon but upon all generations that have read the Bible and followed him since. Now, I'm going to close with this. Hallelujah. God loves sinners today. We read that. When we were yet sinners, he loved us. And this next phrase. Now, I'm sorry. I'm not making much headway here in Revelation. But I want to tell you what Jesus Christ is like. He loves you. Yeah. He'll never quit loving you. And the next, verse says, the next phrase says, He loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Let me just deal with this and I'll close. He washed us. 
You notice in his love how that when he started dealing with our sins, he did the washing. Nobody else did it for him. We couldn't look to the pastor. We couldn't look to the priest. We couldn't look to the organization. We couldn't look to a doctrine to do it. He did it. He washed us. Peter faced the Sanhedrin in uh, Acts chapter uh, 4 and verse 12. And he said, there is none in the name under heaven. Give it among men whereby we must be saved. No place else you can look for it. He did it. There are those, and as I said before, and I have it here, in the Gospels we see Jesus of Nazareth, the man of Galilee. In Revelation we see him as God Almighty. He has gone behind the veil for us. The fundamental historic churches sees him only as the Christ of the Gospels. They don't see the deity. Many historical churches uh, today nominal churches lean towards the Jehovah Witness view that Jesus is sort of a wonderful Savior, great man, a superhuman, above the angels, but in no way to be compared with God, Jehovah God. But I want to tell you, no way to be equal, they say. Not equal with Jehovah. The Jehovah's Witness explained it that in the tabernacle of Moses, the Holy of Holies is God the Father, Jehovah, their Jehovah, where they're witnesses of. But out in the sanctuary, that's the place where Jesus is, the Christ of the Gospels, of Nazareth. But they don't see the Christ of Revelation. He's Almighty God. And He's the only one we can go to. He is one with the Father, equal with the Father. He is Jehovah. But He washed us. He did it. And Peter said, there's no other way. You can't get it through Buddha. You can't get it by Moses, the law. You can't get it through good works. You can't get it by religion. No other way. He did it. He washed us. I want to take a word by word now here. He washed us. Oh, I like that word washed. Aren't you glad he washed us instead of cutting off the offending members? <laughs> what would be left of us? You know, if you're... Hand the fins that Jesus said, cut it off. Now, he wasn't given a practical solution to a problem. He was showing them that it's not their hand that affects it, it's their heart. And it's not to be cut off, it's to be washed. Don't blame it on your hand. And God isn't going to cut your hand off to solve your problem. Or any other organ in your body. He washes it. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. He doesn't beat it in submission. He washes it. Amen. And how good it feels when you come to the altar and you give yourself to God. Say, God, here I am. I'm unworthy, but I want you to wash me in your blood. And you get up from that altar and you feel like you've had a bath Amen. in your spirit. Yeah. Feel clean. Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, a man might come home from work, working in the, mi in the coal mines. All right? Take that for instance. Working in the coal mines. He comes home and finds they're having a birthday party. And everybody's there and everybody's dressed up. And they're all looking like, and he walks in, coal dust all over him, you know, it's filthy and his face all black. And, and he just, well, he's not fit to associate with society right now. Okay? But he said, give me a few minutes. Don't come around and hug me now. You get a cold all over you. But give me a few minutes. Goes in and takes a bath. And when he cleans up, puts on some new clothes, he comes out, he's good as any of them. Doesn't have to back off from anybody because he's been washed. And brother, when you get up in the altar, regardless of what you have been in your life, when you have been washed, then you're just right with everybody else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You don't have to back off. So, oh, well, you know, all you people, good people, but I've been a son. If you've been washed, all that's gone. Washed away. I don't know if any of you save the bath water <clears throat> and after you go out to supper or lunch and then go back in and say, well, now pour all that junk on me again. No, you don't save that, do you? So when it's washed, it's gone. You pull the plug and it goes down the drain. So when you get up to the altar and you come and say, God, wash me. When you're washed, don't bring those things up again. Don't bring up what you've been in the past. That's washed. It's cleansed. It's gone. 
He washed you. Hallelujah. He didn't save the bathwater. He didn't save the grime he took off of you. He went down the drain. All right. He washed us from sin. From sin. Not in it. He didn't wash you and leave you in your sin. Brother, we're talking about changes today. And this is part of it. When he washes you from your sin, that means you are not in that sin anymore. You've been washed. Don't let that thing stay around any further. You've been washed from uncleanness, unclean habits, unclean words, unclean thinking, unclean deeds. You've been washed from all that uncleanness. Then don't let that stuff stay around. Say, that's gone. The devil tries to knock on the door and say, hey, I got this uh, present for you. I don't want that present. It's gone. It's washed. It's clean. It's gone. It's not for me anymore. Glory. Hallelujah. Yeah, but I just have to have it once in a while. No, you don't. If it's washed, it's gone. All right? And he washes us from our sins. Hallelujah. No one else's. Not Adam's. Not dad's sins. Not the parents' sins. From our sins. Don't try to pass this off on somebody else. He washes you from your sins. All right? If you go to hell, don't blame the hypocrites in the church. Don't blame the preacher to preach false doctrine to you. Don't blame anybody else. He washes you from your sins. And if you don't get washed from your sins, then you're not ready to meet God. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. In his blood. Oh, glory to God. I'm going to quit because I got so much. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Acts 20, 28. He has Purchase us, the church, with his own blood. Bought us. That's the price that he paid. And his, the blood means his life. The life of Christ. I have to deal with that some of that. Let me, let me just deal with so I don't have to come back to it again. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. You're not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Redeemed with the incorruptible. Not with the corruptible thing. You're de redeemed with the incorruptible and precious blood of Christ. That blood is incorruptible. That life that he gives you will not corrupt. Adam's life will always corrupt. No matter how good it is, no matter how many band-aids you put on it, no matter how you wash up Adam's life, it'll corrupt. Amen. But the life of Christ is incorruptible. Amen. You have that life of Christ in you? It will not turn to sin. All right? Now, and it's precious. Oh, it's precious. I got to quit. Hebrews 9, 14 says, Our conscience is washed and purged from sin. One verse I was going to deal with, I'll do it some other time, but I've got to say here, and that is, later on in this uh, chapter first, further down in this, uh, in this verse, it said, Behold, he comes with clouds, every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. They pierced him. He loved us. He washed us. But they pierced him. Amen. What are you going to do today? Pierce him again with a life of rebellion? With a life of rejection? Are you going to go out and pierce him again? How can we pierce somebody who loves us so much? How can we do anything and believe me, I'm preaching to myself as well as you. But how could we do anything to pierce anyone who loves us so much? Probably the person in this world who loves me more than anybody else is my wife. And if I come home to the one that loves me the most every day, beat up on her, what a sick individual I would be piercing. He's the one that loves you more than anybody else. And they pierced him. How they pierced him. I got to talk about something. Would you bow your heads? Father, we thank you for Jesus. He loved us. Gave himself for us. Oh God. He loved us and gave himself for us. For us. That we might have his life within us. I pray if there's anyone here this morning does not have that life or the needs of cleansing, they'll come and let you cleanse them today. In the name of Jesus.
thank you for listening. We pray you were blessed by this message. For written materials or to leave an offering, please visit billbrittonministries.com.